my son's life, uh, her daughter's life, that then enough people had to see in the heart of the community that certain people are speaking of so that then we can rise up in that world. Absolutely, because when I speak of a evolution, an evolution in consciousness, because I usually give an example such as Michael and Kolafu, uh, for example, is in such dimension. I'm saying that, you know, when we look at the mind of humanity, the single mind, the single mind itself, the brain itself, the knowledge that we have acquired through this century is like a light that is falling on top of this mind. It's like, like an ocean. And the mind is vaporizes itself in a, in a very mystic way, in a place which we call it, that we don't see it, we do not see it. And then suddenly the conditions are right. And I'm talking about the mind of humanity as a whole. And then suddenly there is the winds from Canada come, and the moisture is in the air, and suddenly it rains. So I'm talking about that kind of conscious revolution or revolution that is taking place and here we are at this particular intersect where we are here at the level of the consciousness and understanding of God in humanity and his creation and everything that he has done by. And he is asking us to get, as I said, to take this quantum leap, jump up on the tree. Look at the humanity as a whole. Don't separate anybody. Because to me, all my religions, he says, is like flowers in a garden, different colors, different flavors, different aromas. To the time and of all of my people, we are able to, or like the flowers in the garden, with different colors, different habits, different colors. So he says, I like the garden. Also, I don't like just any shit. I like the garden. He says, come. That's why the garden. Yeah. Give me my garden back. That's what he's requiring of us. And so you are part of the precipitation, or for we in mean, this circle, at the beginning of the circle. Those who overcome, they like you to be the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of the world. And so, what this is, is a study in the to the heart of Jewish mysticism. In order to understand Christianity, we have to understand what we're claiming. We came out of a system of ancient Jewish mysticism that has to do with the study of this ancient symbol. So by reaching into this symbol and seeing how it reveals itself, all of its many transformations, how it revealed itself to the Buddha, how it revealed itself to the Hindus, how it revealed itself to indigenous American peoples, how it revealed itself in Africa, to the shamans of Africa. Then we begin to see how all of the religions of the earth are literally one. And that the only difference between us is the differences that were created as we fell apart from each other in terms of language and geography. And nevertheless, and then all of our systems sort of grew up looking like different systems. But in reality, what is happening is we are now come to the end of the age. We're, we're observing the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the trumpet in the new moon, the prophets told us that when we came to this one particular time in history where the sun is setting in the midst of all the events of our time, we would come to this place right here and all of the darkness would have come to perfection, the age would come to an end and an entire new age would be born. The age of Kali Yuga would come to its conclusion. Is it ending? It depends. Paramahansa Yogananda says we're just beginning. Well, we're about 2,000 years into a 270,000 year cycle. I know Prabhupada, uh, you mean uh, the um, uh, Sarasvati Prabhupada? No, no, Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda. Oh, uh, yes, because in, 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 in Vedic thought, usually time frames were usually multiplied by tens and twenties because they were seeing um, into like the macrocosmic world as opposed to the cycle that is actually unfolding right here in the microcosmic world. 
right now we're involved in this microcosmic unfolding where darkness is coming to its conclusion and the light is about to be born and we know that's happening because not only are the mysteries of the tree of life which is are the mysteries of course of Vedic consciousness and also Christian consciousness but the great dragon is appearing you see the continent of Eurasia see that Asia is a great big dragon with its mouth wide open Europe Italy is the tongue sticking out of the dragon's wide open mouth Europe is the head of this great dragon. Scandinavia is the right limb. Asia Minor is the left. And all of Asia is the body and the tail of the dragon. And this dragon is metaphorically the dragon, the serpent that Indra made war against in the beginning of Vedic times. The dragon is the lower consciousness of man. It's the earth out of which we are created. And now it's time to that there should be a colossal battle against the dark forces, against the dragon. In order for us to see it, the planet had to reveal it to us. God had to reveal it to us. Now we can engage the darkness in battle. Because if they could see the dragon, they wouldn't be getting ready to be swallowed up in the mouth of this great creature in the age and the wars that they're getting ready to be involved in. For God, who dwells in the sum of all reality, is getting ready to invite them into the heart of Asia itself, to encircle them by all of those forces that are in the East. That's, you see, we are now passing into the Vedic age, I mean into the age of Aquarius. 2,000 years ago, when Christianity began, the world passed into the age of Pisces. 2,000 years before that was the Vedic age, the age of Aries, the Ram. The ram symbolizes all of the powers of the East that God has reserved for himself, Brahma has reserved for himself against the day of battle and war. And now we are coming to that day and all the powers of the West who say that they are walking in the light of Christ but are not, are getting ready to be drawn up into this age-ending battle so that only the light can remain. Only that which is pure and only that which is righteous can remain. And in that process, this age will collapse in a whole new age. So in layman's terms, who are the good guys? Then? The good guys is everybody who has this light burning in them and refrains from killing, refrains from injustice, and refrains from warfare. Because you see, only the meek, only the pure in heart, only the peacekeepers, only those who thirst and hunger for righteousness sake can inherit the age to come. Those who come in the dark shadow or the dark light of that reality are now revealing themselves. See, they say they are Christians, but if they are truly are, then they would be afraid of what God is doing right now. And they wouldn't be getting ready to go out and engage God in battle. Because God promised to bring this age to its inclusion. That's why God sent the Spirit of Christ into the world to inform us of those things. So if we are walking in the light of those teachings, we will not be getting now in, in, the, in the day of battle making war. We'll be walking in peace and holiness with all men. We'll be what, walking in the righteousness of God. What is the significance of this right here, the presidential? Well, the scripture says that the day of the Lord will not come until the antichrists are revealed, the sons of perdition. And it says, and in order to understand who they are, that you have to... So it's more than one man. It's a, it's a whole system. It's a, it's a man. It's a very specific individual who we are commanded to. Party the card. <laughs> Oh, the scripture says when the deceiver comes, he comes as a minister of righteousness and as an angel of light. He comes speaking peace with his mouth, but in his heart he's not peace but a sword. Jimmy Carter talks the rhetoric of peace, but Jimmy Carter is an extreme warrior. Jimmy Carter is a nuclear physicist. He's just had a nuclear strike force submarine named after him. And he went up to New London, Connecticut and accepted all the honors that come with that, having the USS and Jimmy Carter named after him. But see, the scripture says, well, first of all, pardon me? He was the one of the most mild-mannered, most muscular, most 
Yes, but those who know him say he is steely, cruel. Jimmy Carter is a cruel man to those in his circle. He does not like people. Jimmy Carter doesn't like poor people. He likes issues. You see, he'll work among poor people, but not among the poor people. He'll work. He has to have celebrities around. He has to have. It's to enhance his own image of himself. Jimmy Carter likes helping the poor, but he doesn't go sit in the house of the poor. He doesn't share fellowship with poor people. He's always among rich industrialists, globalists. He goes one week a year and works for Habitat for Humanity. But in the beginning, he thought that Habitat Humanity were a bunch of crackpots. Only when he left the presidency and understood how that could enhance his reputation did he then endear himself to that organization. But in the beginning, when they asked him, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. And that's why the scripture says that when he comes, he comes speaking peace, but in his not, heart is not peace for the sword. It says he comes magnifying himself in his heart, but by peace he shall deceive many. And he comes as a minister of righteousness, but an angel of light. But this whole system is the system of Antichrist. And that's why the scripture says, Now little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. For they went out from us, but they were not of us. Now, to discover the, the character and the person of the antichrist itself and himself. Well, they say he doesn't regard the um, company of women. Uh... No, the, you see, he does not regard the, the god of women. You see, Vishnu, who is the symbol of this mystery of the Tree of Life, was, um, uh, how does it say, that he was the God beloved of women. And Vishnu revealed himself, the God of war, revealed himself to the West in the form of the non-violent sacrifice of Christ. So he who is Lord, creator, destroyer, revealed himself to Arjuna, who is John the Baptist, in his two-handed form. And the two-handed form is the Lamb of God. This is the Christian mystery. And that's why we are commanded to walk as absolute pacifists, as absolute non-violent children of God in the day that Krishna rises up in the world to bring a judgment against the Western world. Because the Vedas say that Krishna, who is the eighth manifestation of Vishnu, and this is where we are, we're moving into this state of consciousness, descends every ge uh, after generation after generation to destroy injustice out of the world. And that's why the Lord revealed himself in this form to the mind of the adepts of the Christian mysteries. And that's why we must be absolute pacifists in this time not cowards, not, we must be active in our pacifism. We must be spiritual warriors. And so now we see we have come to the end of the age and who are antichrist? They are those who come in the name of Christ violating the precepts of Christ. Right, they are not, they make war, they oppress, they are friends of the rich and the powerful, they oppress the poor, they, uh, have established themselves as authorities over us, which we were commanded by Christ not to do. We are a circle, we are not to sit above each other. There should be no authoritarianism among ourselves. These men are uh, uh, rulers of a police state. They are fascists. They believe in power and the exercise of power, not only over the world, but over the people of America themselves. And we are supposed to come out from this system. And so in order to see how to interpret that, the authors of the book of Revelation said, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And when you go back to the Brahmic age, the time when Aaron and Moses were studying this ancient Vedic tradition, they realized that the creators in the Vedic system were Brahma and 
his female consort, the goddess Sarasvati. Moses, a student of Vedic tradition as well as all of the Egyptian mysteries, simply takes Vedic thought, brings it into a Hebrew frame of mind, and gives us Abraham and Sarah. Well, Abraham and Sarah are none other than Brahma and Sarasvati, father and mother, and we are their children. And that's why we in the Hebrew Western tradition have Abraham and Sarah as our, as our divine mother and father. So this mystery now passes down into the West. Hi. There's only one, there's only one true religion. Some of us are coming as Christians, some as Jews, some as Buddhists, some as Hindus. Well, I grew up in the Christian tradition. But as I matured in my faith, I realized that to be a true Christian is to be a true Jew. And to be a true Jew is to be a true Muslim. To be a true Muslim is to be a true Buddhist, and is to be a true Vedic. And it is also having come to the West to find ourselves deeply initiated into the spirituality of indigenous people here in the West. Because this is what the Tree of Life does. It links the heaven to the earth. Indigenous people are stewards over the mysteries of the earth. So where do the presidents come in? I don't get it. Well, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about right now. Okay, that's the best part. So, so Abraham, in the Old Testament, God speaks to Abraham and says, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea in multitude. Mm -hmm. So the book of Revelation says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Well, the beast is the age-ending empire that has come up out of the sea of nations to the western ends of the age and has simply become in our time the most powerful empire that has ever ruled in the history of humankind. The U.S. The United States okay. of America. Now, Where do we go from there? Well, I just wanted to show him how to come to from the there. conclusion that this individual yeah. is where the number fits. Oh. So the book of Revelation then describes in symbolic form the character and the nature, nature of this empire. And it comes to this verse. It says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding, and these are the first two sephirot on the tree of life. Wisdom, chokmah, understanding, bina. Okay. And these are the teachings of Moses and Aaron that have passed down through John the Baptist and Paul to where we are right here. This is the end of the age. This is what is being born. An entire new age is in the process of being born. So it says, here is wisdom. Let him that count have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 666. Ronald Wilson Reagan. No. <laughs> Jimmy Carter. No. That's not 666. He Ronald has, Wilson Reagan no, is 666. No, just because he has six letters in each of his names. But in order to see how the number fits right here, what you must see first is the dragon. You see, see, the, yeah. see the continent of Europe? You see that Europe is a great, big, tremendous, immense dragon with its mouth wide open? You see Italy is the tongue sticking out of the dragon's wide open mouth. Europe is the head of this dragon. Scandinavia is the right limb. The right limb. Asia Minor is the left That's a tad bit of a stretch, but okay. I can... Well, it's, if you can see it, you can, can see it. I can if see you it. can't see it, you can't see it. But if you can see it, then you can understand what is going on in the 20th century. So who's 666? <laughs> well, I'm coming to it. Sorry. So the prophet Isaiah says this. Not only did they say that when we came to the end of the age that the dragon would surface out of the consciousness of the planet into human consciousness, it says, in that day the Lord with his saw and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, the crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. These were the beginnings of the world wars of the 20th century, when Woodrow Wilson, declared war on Central Europe. He declared war on the Axis powers in Vienna, Austria. 
1917. This, the book of Matthew says, are the beginning of sorrows. And now, to understand what God has raised up in the 20th century in America, we simply take a little walk through the scriptures. And the scripture, the Apostle Paul, looking into our time, full of wisdom and understanding, is talking to the Jews in Athens. And he says to them, he says to them, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon us which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, he despises and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. The Apostle Paul is saying, Now beware when this happens in the world. And he's quoting from the book of the prophet Habakkuk. And the prophet says, right here, Therefore the law is slack, and judgment will never go forth, for the wicked that competh about the righteous. For behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. I will raise up the Chaldeans, which means the kingdom of Babylon. The Chaldeans were the Babylonians. And it says, And that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land, to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. The USA. The USA. And this whole chapter describes America. So, Woodrow Wilson declares war in Central, I mean, on Central Europe in the name of Jesus. This is the beginning of the meaning of the mark of the number of the beast. When Woodrow Wilson sets it up, he is none other than the king of Babylon. And when we go to the book of Daniel, we read that the king of Babylon in ancient times, the king called Nebuchadnezzar, he had a vision. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision. And he says, and he couldn't get any of the, the, the advisors, his advisors, the economic, the economists, the, uh, the newspaper reporters, the State Department uh, counselors to interpret the vision. And he says, thus with a vision of my head in my bed, I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. So he saw the tree of life. Because this is how we can interpret all of these things. And the midst of the earth and the height thereof was great and the tree grew and was very strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven, which means it reaches all the way into the east and the sight thereof to the ends of the earth all the way to the west and this is where we are. We're in the West, we're at this place right here, at the place number seven. This is the end of the age, and this is the age that is in the process of being born. And so, Daniel interprets the dream. He says that you are the object of this dream. And then it says that God gave the king of Babylon a beast's heart. And so, now when he raises up the king of Babylon again, we see that the first of these kings sets up the image. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. So we have to get to 660 cubits. He sets it up 60 and he says, and, and the breadth are of six cubits and he sets it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This well, the reason of the, this is part of the image of the beast. It's or? part of the image of the beast. This is how you count the number, which is 660 and six. It starts with him. He sets it up, and it's 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. And the reason it's 60 cubits is because when you go into ancient Babylon, the ancient Babylonians used the number 60. They had a base 60 mathematical system, and they used it to calculate time. That's why we in the West have 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, because the prophets knew that we would adopt the Babylonian time uh, frame. So they used the number 60. 
So now God is raising up the king of Babylon. It, he sets up an image. It's 60 cubits high. It's the image of the majesty, the magnitude, the power, and the might of the office of the American presidency. And Woodrow Wilson is declared in his time a messiah in the world. When he goes and he invades Europe with the American expeditionary forces, he brings about the end of the war in Europe. He begins to establish the League of Nations, which led to the United Nations. In his time, of course, the Soviet Union also came to power. That's why the book of Revelation says, after the white horse came the red horse. Now, so he sets up the image, but 60 years later, 60 years later, Jimmy Carter comes to the office of the American presidency. Now, you remember, it says that he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And when you count 60 cubits for every one of these administrations, when it gets to Jimmy Carter, it is 660 cubits high. And this is a measure of these men's sense of their own greatness in the earth. For the tree grew and it was strong. And that's why we're commanded to know every tree by its fruits. You either make the tree good or you make the tree evil. John the Baptist came, looked into our time and said, now is the ax laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit will be cut down and cast into the fire. That's what God is getting ready to do right now. And so we see that the image was set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. We see that with Jimmy Carter, the image is 660 cubits high. And then the scripture also says, for those who speak of themselves seek their own glory. Well, this is a page written by the Carter family of the Carter family. Welcome to Plains, Georgia. Home, Georgia, the Garden of Eden. Home of the President of the United States. The religious influence on this region dates back to its inception. Plains was named for the Plain of Dura. King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden <laughs> idol upon the Plain of Dura. And then when Plains moved two miles closer to the railroad track, they shortened the name to the Plains. This is the son of perdition. This is the one that we must watch. Even though this Antichrist is getting ready to bring judgment upon the Western world because he's a warrior, this one will bring a fiercer judgment because he comes as a man of peace, but he is a warrior. And so then the scripture says, You familiar with these books here? Hello? The apocryphal books? This is a King James Version of the books that were taken out of the Bible in the 1500s, in, in 1611 actually, when, see these books were in the Bible until 1611 when the Protestants took them out, but the Catholics left them in. So these books are still in a Vulgate version in the Catholic Bible, but these were taken out of the Protestant Bible, but this is a, nevertheless a King James Version of those books. And among them is the book of Maccabees, the book of Bell and the Dragon, the books of Susanna and Judith, but also the two books of the prophet Esdras. Now, these books were in the hands of John the Baptist and Paul, the authors of the New Testament. These are older than the New Testament themselves. And the prophet Esdras is asking God to give him a vision of the last days. And he says, He says, Therefore now I will beseech the highest, that he will comfort me unto the end. Therefore comfort me and show me thy servant the interpretation and plain difference of this fearful vision, that thou mayest perfectly comfort my soul. For thou hast judged me worthy to show me the last times. And he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision. The eagle, which is a symbol not only of the United States, but of the office of the American presidency. The eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel. 
but it was not expounded unto him. Therefore, now I declare it unto you. Behold, the days will come and there shall rise up a kingdom upon the earth and it shall be feared above all the kingdoms that were before it. And in the same shall 12 kings reign one after another. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Antichrist. Hmm. Now, then the book of Revelation says, And then I beheld another beast came up out of the earth. No, Carter. Carter, says Carter is where the number sits. However, you'll see how this works out. It says, and all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Doesn't mean they'll worship Carter. They'll worship the majesty of this office because this is the beast. It's the system. It's all the individuals who rule over Meaning the democratic system? Or the American become? capitalist, religious, Judeo-Christian system. See, they have come in the name of Christ, not as servants, but as conquerors. They come oppressing, killing, making war, building empires. We're not allowed to do any of those things in the name of Christ. And now the United States is trying to pass itself off as a righteous nation and doesn't realize that it is the kingdom of the beast itself. And it says, And if any man hath an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I beheld another beast came up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Well, these two came to office together. So this is the first beast. Now all of a sudden, Reagan and Bush come to office, and it says here, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Well, his name is Woodrow Wilson. His name is Ronald Wilson Reagan. He was born during World War I. And that's why the scripture says, this book says, whereof when the second shall begin to reign and shall have more time than any of the 12. So Ronald Wilson Reagan now comes and what does he do? He sets up, just as Woodrow Wilson set up the image, and it came to a time of despair under Jimmy Carter. All of a sudden, Ronald Wilson Reagan comes and sets up the image again. And he restores the majesty, the power of the office of the American presidency again in the earth. And under his administration, the Soviet Union collapses. The new world order begins to be born. See, I heard a different theory on it. I heard that the little horn is supposed to be the British Empire and the horn that arises from that that's is all the to be Anglo, American. That's the Anglo-Israeli yeah. theory. And what about the UN League of Nations theory? Well, of course. Now you watch for that man. He's moving around in international circles. He's, see, there's a book just printed about Jimmy Carter called The Unfinished <laughs> Presidency of Jimmy Carter. It says that he is the only person that has ever used the office of the American presidency as a stepping stone to higher office. <laughs> and Jimmy Carter is now moving around as the world's premier statesman, its greatest peacekeeper, its religious and spiritual spokesman for the new global order. And so, so as Jimmy Carter has transcended American politics, he's already above it. George Bush, he's a nationalist. Jimmy Carter is an internationalist. Well, I'll, I'll show you how it comes to that. So, Ronald Reagan has now set up the image, and in his time, the Soviet Union collapses. That's why the scripture says, now, who is like the beast? Who can make war with the beast? All of a sudden, the United States of America becomes the only superpower left in the earth with its reach and its ability to uh, order the affairs of all the other nations in the earth. And so it says, who is like the beast? And of course, it seemed like America was invincible up until last Tuesday morning. And, and so now we see the Gulf War unfolds. We see America is now trying to create the world in its own fallen image. 
But the prophet Esdras sees two other feathers underneath the wings of the eagle. And he says, And whereas thou saw two feathers under the wings, passing over the head that is on the right side. You see, this is the eagle. Now, this is the side of love and endurance. This is where we are. We are exercising the wisdom of God, the love of God, the endurance of God. If Bill Clinton ever was a true hippie, ever was a true anti-war activist, as he imagined himself to be, he has instead passed over to the side of power and majesty. He has sitting in the seat of the scornful. He began now to sit in the most powerful seat. He thought, Bill Clinton thought that being sort of a hippie that he was, he thought that he could actually go into the system and change it. And that was his sentiments. He actually thought that he was going to make this system more responsive to the needs of the people. But instead of changing the system, he got devoured. And finally, all he was doing is just enjoying the glory of being president himself. He was no longer interested in changing the system because he knew he couldn't. He was in their trap, so he's just taking up time. But finally, the second one comes. And it says, it signifies that these are they whom the highest have kept unto their end. This is the small kingdom and full of troubles as thou sawest, which means that in his time, the God of the universe will come against this empire. And that's why it says, and the lion whom thou sawest, rising up out of the wood and roaring and speaking to the eagle and rebuking her for her unrighteousness with all the words which thou hast heard, this is the anointed whom the highest has kept for them and for their wickedness unto the end. And he shall reprove them and he shall upbraid them with their cruelty. Will you do this directly or through other people? He's going to do it through all the powers of the earth. And we saw it began last Tuesday morning. Was so the this, beginning. it doesn't mean they're righteous. It just means that he's working through them. It just means that they are in darkness and they, you know, see, in the East, God, in the religion of Islam, God has Muslims bowing down five times a day. And through this, God is showing the world that if he wanted to, he could have the whole world as slaves. He could make everyone a slave doing his absolute will. In Islam, the mantra is hear and obey. But here in the West, we are commanded through the scriptures to stand upon our feet as sons and daughters of God to understand what the will of God is. Here in the West, our commandment is read and understand. And that is the difference. So Osama bin Laden is simply a slave of God. He has been raised up by God to bring this divine judgment against the Western world, in doing so, revealing the dark spirit that dwells here and rules over this land. Oh, Bush is a very evil man, and he's so evil he doesn't know it. He's in darkness. His you know mind, it. huh? You know it. We, we get, didn't you ever see him give one of those speeches? And you see, he's given a speech, and then all of a sudden, but he's a very pathetic man because he's on a string. You see, all the powers have got him jumping around. And whenever he, he gives a speech, you ever see that little Freudian grin yeah. that kind of smirks up in his yeah. face? Yeah. Now he's. Now he's trying to, you know, pass himself off as a um, as a real warrior because he's trying to please that. What's the significance of that grin that he has, that Freudian grin you said? Yeah, well, I mean, what it just means that he knows he's out of his place. He shouldn't be there. That the powers of his father's powers have put him there uh, just so that they could manipulate that office. It's, but they're all in darkness. See, there's only one truth and spirit in the universe, and that's God. And God is conspiring against the darkness itself. What about the devil? Though? Well, the devil, the devil, it's, it, it, well, the devil is ourselves. The devil is this collective lower consciousness of man, and that's the only, you know, the only battle we're allowed to fight in the world against evil is the war against ourselves. And having overcome ourselves, then we are free 
to see evil in anyone else. But once we do that, we see that the weapons of our warfare are no longer those that kill other human beings. The weapons that we use now are spiritual weapons. The words of God is our weapons, not guns and tanks and airplanes and everything. That's how they prove that they are the sons of darkness. But once you can see the dragon, you can see what's going on. You see the continent of Europe. I don't know if you can see it from both sides. You see the continent of Europe. Well, the continent of Europe is a great, big, immense dragon with its mouth wide open. Italy is the tongue sticking out of the dragon's wide open mouth. Europe is the head. Scandinavia is the right limb. Asia Minor is the left limb of this great creature. And all of Asia is the body and the tail of this great dragon. Can you see the, can you see the countenance of this great creature? And if so, then you can see what is happening and what began to happen last Tuesday morning. It says here in the book of Isaiah, well, it also says that when we are faithful to observe our ordinances that God has given us, particularly right now, we're observing the high holy days. This is blowing the trumpet in the new moon, in the days appointed. It's where the sun is setting and all of the events of the western end of the age, because we have come to the end of our age, to this place number seven. The blowing of the trumpet in the new moon, and I won't get really into that, is a sign of the return of the divine feminine principle to its rightful place in the cosmic scheme of things. Our Divine Mother is descending to us and she is revealing her mysteries because she is God. She is the Creator and now she's restoring balance to the earth. Everything that is out of balance will be put back in balance. Right now the rich are ruling over the poor, the powerful are ruling over the, the, the weak, the meek. And for 2,000 years males have been ruling over females and the Divine Mother in league with the Father is getting ready to change all of that. The Father is rising up in the East to bring a judgment against the West. The Divine Mother is descending into the Western ends of the Earth and she's bringing forth a child. There's a child being born here and we're all experiencing the contractions of the birth of the coming age. In order for a new to be born, this must come to its conclusion. And that's why the Divine Mother is revealing her mysteries, among them is this great dragon, and now we can interpret the prophets that say, In that day the Lord with his saw and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Well now we see the judgment coming against the powers of the Western world, and particularly against America, and last Tuesday morning, we saw this scripture fulfilled right before our very eyes. And there shall be upon every high mountain, which means every great nation, and upon every high hill, rivers and streams of water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Isaiah 30, 25. We saw this happen before our eyes Tuesday morning. God sent a spirit of war against the Western world and flew those two kamikaze planes right into those towers to fulfill this scripture. And it says, And then moreover the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that God binds up the breach of their people and heals the stroke of our wound. So we have come now to the end of the age and all the events that we see unfolding in our time is what God is what God is doing is shaking the planet, quickening our state of consciousness so that we understand and do not be afraid of the things that's coming. Because what is coming is not only war in the earth to end war, but what is coming is the collapse of the entire Western geopolitical, military, and economic system. It's about time. It's about time. That's exactly right. And so what we want to see 
is that God brings these things to pass that we don't fear. And we do not worry when they come out arresting people and charging people with sedition and treason because we will not support the war effort of America in its attempt to preserve its uh, power in the world because God will be coming against it economically, militarily. And here in America, you see, in 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in Russia, he came to America and he realized that the true spiritual revolution, the true social revolution, could not happen in Russia because Russia is a peasant society. He came here and he saw that only in America could the true revolution of human consciousness unfold because it's here where we have, as Leonard Cohen says, a thirst for truth, a thirst for religious consciousness. But not only that, we have talent, we have skills, and we have access to the means of communication. And it's only here that these ideas can be communicated rapidly from one side of the country to the other, between individuals. And this system doesn't realize what it did when it put these things in our hands. Because, and of course it was God doing that, because all the timing of the Spirit is perfect. So only here can the true spiritual nation be born. And when that nation is born, just as every child is born out of the darkness of its own mother's womb, we are being born out of the darkness of this age. And we're feeling now the contractions of the birth of that coming event. And we want to make sure that we do not buckle or fear or cower when they come. You know, George Bush just the other day instituted the Department of Homeland Security, which means that he's setting loose the brown shirts. The United States of America has we've always known it's a police state, but now we're going to see it in vivid color. He's, the United the law enforcement agencies in America are going to be given broad sweeping powers to curtail any activity that poses a threat to national security. And in particular, when the people, by the thousands and thousands and thousands, begin to come out and have nothing to do with the defense of this country, well, that will be a terrible threat to this country and, they, and the tribulations will be great, but in the unfolding, more and more and more and more will come out and the system will collapse and that's what Jesus taught and great shall be the fall of it. We saw the Soviet Union collapse in 10 days. Well, when the Western political order collapses, it will be the greatest collapse in the face in the history of humankind. But when it happens, a nation of righteousness and justice, true love, true planetary consciousness, a nation of servants, not masters. When the people that are survive this judgment and begin to form themselves on the morning of the coming age, they will go out into all of the places of the earth and begin the healing and the restoration of the planet. So all of these things are good and they're all unfolding right now. It's not something we have to wait any longer for. They are happening right now. What's your name? Uh, Mike. Oh, Murphy. <laughs> Michael Murphy. Yeah. That's a, in Ireland, that name is as common as Mike. So it's, you're not in Ireland. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do, You've got this all figured out, Michael Murphy. Well, I, I don't... I, maybe, if it happens, then it's figured out. But it's not me. I just... A guy with a lot of time on his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, plays. You're doing well. Th does um, Revelation 17 and 18 have anything to do with the events that just occurred? Sure. Revelation 18 Directly is the, the United Empire. States and the command to come out of this system, my people, that we be not partakers of her sins. And that we Thank you very much. God bless you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I still want that. And here, you have access to a computer. Keep your sons. Well, that's, thank you. This is all coming from the Divine Mother. She's the author of our life. God is the author of our hope, and uh, all we have to do is get in touch with that, stay that way. Can I have one? Oh, man. 
There's you. There's Earth Mother. There's the Earth Mother. And I bet her teachings are the same. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, love and um, How about Georgia's The Garden of Eden? I'm interested in that. Yes. Uh, well, anybody else want one of these? Yeah, you want thought that was bad, uh. Yeah. Well, what I did is I took some verses out of the Gnostic Gospels and just... Thank you. Are you here all the time, Michael? Yes, I'll be here uh, during the entire duration of the Holy Days. Right now it's Rosh Hashanah, we're experiencing the 10 days of all leading to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then after that is the seven days of Sukkot, which God's children are commanded to dwell in temporary dwellings as a sign that we are strangers and pilgrims in the earth and we must not imagine that anything here belongs to us because we're just passing through. So as long as uh, they let me stay here, the CAA doesn't come and arrest me, but I don't think they would yet. They're not threatened <laughs> by anybody like me yet. Um, then I'll be here during that time. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. What is your name? Sharon Finn, F-I-N-N. Oh, my. I don't think it's... Of the old song. Irish eyes. The Gospel of Thomas says, The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us how our end will be. And Jesus said, Have you then discovered the beginning so that you inquire about the end? For where the beginning is, there shall be the end. Blessed is he who shall stand at the beginning, and he shall know the end, and he shall not taste death. Well, what we do is we simply realize that this book is a circle. This is the wheel of dawn. And it begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. So in the book of Genesis we see where God put the tree of life in the garden of Eden. The tree of life is the source of all ancient religious understanding. Whether it, and you see, having come to this place, we have come to the feet of the mystery, which are also the lotus feet of Vishnu. And we know that all the rivers went out of Eden in ancient time. The scripture says one of them became the Ganges. That's why the Ganges has her source in the lotus feet of Vishnu. Because that means that the ancient knowledge of the Veda went out from this land in the ancient Atlantean times. And on its way from the west to India, of course, it passed through the wars of Atlantis where Indra made war against the dragon and all of these mysteries then found their way to India then these mysteries found their way to Egypt and they gave structure to all of Egyptian understanding and now we have come full circle back to where it all began and so as we begin to open the scriptures it says in the book of Ecclesiastes of Ecclesiastes says the very first chapter now what profit hath a man all his labor which he taketh under the sun for one generation passeth away and another generation coming but the earth abideth forever the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasten to the place where he arose the reason being is because this is where the mysteries begin the wind goeth about toward the south, and turneth about toward the north, and it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. The spirit returns back to the beginning. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full, unto the place from whence the rivers come, to the they return again. And so the mysteries that began here have now returned here, back to the original Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life 
And that's why the book of Isaiah says, what, have you not known from the beginning? Have we not understood? Have we not known? Have we not heard? Have it not been told us from the beginning? Have you not understood this from the foundations of the earth? And see, this is the foundation of the tree of life. It's the foundation of the entire Western mystery. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And this is the circle of Genesis, the circle of Dharma that is unfolding across the, the, the course of the history of our times. The inhabitants thereof of us grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. And so now God is now judging the rulers of the world, particularly the Western world. So then it says in the book of Revelation that those who ever come, that him that hath an ear, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So when we come to the book of Revelation, in order to interpret this book, we must have access to this very ancient symbol, this ancient oracle that has been passed down for thousands of generations. And as the lotus of human consciousness opens and we begin to study the Vedic, the sciences of the Vedas, when we begin to study the meaning of all the world's religions, we see every religion on earth has its roots and its meaning in the consciousness of the world tree. And so that's why God is bringing everyone back here. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus. We are all coming back here to the western ends of the earth and learning to re, to re-love one another. Learning to reverence each other, to discover the wisdom that each system brings to the light. And when we learn to reverence each other, we reverence each other's teachings, and as we take each other's teachings into account, we begin to see how that which was in part now begins to construct itself in the whole of God's <laughs> wisdom. So that now we have a, 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 a nation of people right here in the West who understand that to be a true Christian is to be a true Hindu, is to be a true Jew, a true Muslim, a true Buddhist. Because we're learning to see how all of our religious traditions connect at their esoteric levels, at their underlying levels, not on their outer levels. The outer levels are given by God to fool the unaided and unperfected mind. It's the inner dimensions, the inner wisdom that is hidden on the inside of the tree that allows us to break loose from Maya, the illusion, and see that we're all one. And so that's what, and, and in that website, if you have access to it, uh, the second chapter talks about the garden. Of the Did Dr. Amani leave? Oh, he's coming back? Because I wanted to see him. I, didn't know. I have one more question for you. What is the significance of the story of Noah, specifically when they talk about um, how the sons of man um, start to commingle with the sons of God? What is that about? Exactly. Well, or the daughters of man start to commingle with the sons of God. Well, as you know, the mystery of Adam is only 6,000 years old. It was 6,000 years ago that God revealed themselves to Adam. And in Adam, God was creating a new race of humankind. It will be made up of all the races of in man. And it will be made up, it would be the religion of true love, true understanding. Well, that religion and Adam, Adam is not the first man. Adam is are not the first human beings. The world was full of human beings before Adam. Adam was the first couple that was able to attain spiritual consciousness, that they were able to attain to the understanding of the unity of God's presence in the sum of all things. So God had now released a new state of consciousness into the world. And Adam now went out to the world and began to sow this state of understanding into the hearts of all others. 